Well, good morning, church. I am super excited to hang out with you today. This is Pastor Johnny bringing you not only God's word, but also um, kind of preparing you because we are about to enter into a season. Uh, there are two different seasons throughout the church um, <clears throat> year that we want to focus on. And uh, one of them being obviously Easter and the story of redemption. But then Easter has a beginning. OK, and that's the story that we're looking at. So as we have just finished the series on Revelation, if you haven't had the chance um, you can always watch that on YouTube. You can watch it on our Facebook. There are many different ways to find that series. We would encourage you to walk through it because it really does prepare your heart for Advent, which is what we're about to walk into, the season where it is the 40 days prior to Christmas where we slow down, we calm down. Our our world is so uh, you know fixed on one major thing, and that is the concept of hurry, that is the number one killer of anyone's relationship with God. We cannot uh, <clears throat> be in a relationship with God and always be in a hurry. We will always miss out on the things that God is doing because he's not in a hurry, as we can obviously see. So as we prepare for, for Advent, I'm super excited to kind of uh, uh, put the, the pieces, the blocks together, the, the, the steps, whatever you will, um, <clears throat> to help you guys understand what really is going on in this season that we call Advent. So uh, we start off with, with you know, if you have your Bibles, you want to turn uh, to the book of Isaiah, more specifically to Isaiah chapter 6. But before I get into that, <clears throat> I kind of want to talk to you guys about something about my childhood. Um, when when I was a kid, we didn't have, we had video games, okay, which a lot of kids nowadays, they, video games, is there, they're everywhere. <clears throat> they're on your phone. They're, they're, you can purchase, you know, video game consoles and there's a variety of different consoles and nowadays everyone's pushing for you know playing on your pc so now your computer which has all the bells and whistles and colors and and apparatuses or whatever can have the ability to play video games like no one else on this planet i get that <clears throat> when i was a kid i didn't have video games i had books i had um things that you had to entertain yourself with so i had action figures i had ninja turtles i had power rangers things like that you know um but one of the things that i love 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 so much and what's funny is someone from this church um once actually gave me this book because as a child you know you had them i lost them um somebody ordered it obviously and and brought it to me and and since that point i've been enjoying it with my kids where's waldo that that was my entertainment well you would sit in the car during road trips or you would be waiting somewhere all you needed was a where's waldo book and it was i, I mean you're gonna see it on the screen right now Where's Waldo? God bless the person who invented it because it was such a fun time of letting your creativity happen. Where's Waldo was uh, a, a thin book, a very large book, where you would see all of these gigantic doodles, these drawings in different uh, time and eras in life, whether it was like uh, castles and knights and, and, and wizards, or maybe you were looking at the Stone Age. Whatever the case was, there was always this like giant picture full of so many different characters that were doing so many different things and it was you would just look through the pages and look for forever and then you would get this uh like list towards the bottom of the page that would say you were looking for the following items one of the main things always was where's waldo waldo you would think would stand out because he you know was dressed in white and and red kind of looking like a uh a, a <clears throat> what's it called a candy cane there you go <laughs> important words are the ones that I remember you know he looked like a candy cane walking around in his blue jeans and then he would be hiding in different places so you would spend eternity looking through every single little bit and corner <clears throat> trying to find where Waldo is finally when you found him it was almost like this sense of like ah uh, like it, it's it, I could you would just be satisfied but what was cool is you would find him on every single page one way or another, if you did your job right, you would always find Waldo in the chaos, in, in, in the, all of the busyness of the page and all that's going on. You would find that simple little guy walking through the scene as if he's going on to the next scene. But it, he was always faithful. He was always there. <clears throat> what does that have to do with today's uh, sermon? You know that you this will all play out in the end. So before I give you the spoiler alert. Why don't we look at Isaiah? The book of Isaiah, which 
Isaiah was not only one of the most major prophets that Judaism recognizes, so much so that even in the New Testament, when they quote scriptures of the Old Testament, if Isaiah is involved, they'll just quote Isaiah, even though the quote may be from multiple different uh, prophets. Isaiah is the major one. He's the big player. <clears throat> Isaiah was around during a time in history. And if you guys will take a moment, there's a lot of backstory before we jump into what we're looking at. Isaiah was uh, a prophet that was called by God <clears throat> to the people of Israel during a time that was really political and really chaotic. So here's Isaiah coming to, to the people. And there's other prophets that, by the way, at the same time, are having the conversation with Israel and Israel's leaders. The conversation goes a little like this. <clears throat> Israel once upon a time had great kings, like really good ones. Ones that would say, hey, we're following God's law. We're going to follow his, his decrees. We're going to follow his desire. We're going to chase after God, like King David, right? But... The issue is that as as other kings came about, as the sons of those kings came about, I'm sorry, guys, they just weren't the best leaders. They weren't focused on God. They were only focused on their own agenda, their own politics, their own power. As a result, um, these kings started to kind of separate themselves from God's law, God's expectations. <clears throat> they started to separate themselves from the priest, from, from those who were trying to direct them, the prophets. The judges who were like, hey, hey, you need to stop. Why are you doing this? And in that process, Israel was constantly being told, listen, guys, God has been very patient with you. He has given you multiple opportunities to change your mind, to stop doing what you're doing, to repent is the word, right? Um, Daniel did the same thing uh, at, at one point or another. Ezekiel does it. Je uh, Jeremiah does it. Isaiah is the heavy hitter saying he was the one that was most renowned and known. So he starts telling the kings, hey, you need to stop. And the kings are basically like, yeah, okay, thank you so much for your opinion. You can move on now. We're doing our own thing. Here's what ends up happening. It gets to the point where God, after years and years and years and years of being patient with Israel as a nation, the people of Israel started to turn to other gods. So they started to turn to Baal or Baal, however you want to pronounce it to these foreign gods that would ask for your children to be sacrificed on, on statues that were on fire, basically. So you would put the child and watch the child burn because the hands of the statue or this idol were put into the furnace. So they would be glowing red as they would put the child on there. All of this obviously upset Isaiah and upset the prophets to the point where they were like, this isn't us. Israel was called to be the people of God. What you're creating Israel is not Israel. You are creating them into a, a bunch of dummies. And they, they are just following their own desires. And they have no idea that God is no longer part of this equation. So God is now going to judge. That was now the warning. It was the, it's too late. God is now going to judge. He's waited year after year after year. But now it's coming. And Isaiah started giving them the warning. There is going to come a kingdom from the north. It's going to come from the desert up, you know, the Euphrates down to us. It is going to attack us. And you are not ready for the destruction of Israel. Israel will be destroyed. As Isaiah is saying this, <clears throat> he has a beautiful moment. He has a moment where God shows up to him. Whether it's physically in the temple or whether he is having a vision similar to John having a vision on the island of Patmos, which is the book of Revelation. Whatever the case is, we get God who shows up. And I want to walk you guys through this because when eventually we get to chapter 7, yes, we're going to be looking at 6 and 7, or a section of 7. <clears throat> we're going to look at why. Why does this happen? For one, you would expect the calling of Isaiah to happen in chapter 1, which most of the time happens in other books. But it seems like Isaiah's calling doesn't happen until chapter 6. Why is that? So I want you, in your Bibles, to read along with me, okay? <clears throat> in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on high, on a lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people 
of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand he had a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord, Who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am, send me. And he replied, Go, say to these people, Keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull. Deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their minds. Turn back and be healed. Then I said, Until when, Lord? Then he replied, Until cities lie in ruin without inhabitants, houses are without people, the land is ruined and desolate, and the Lord drives the people far away, leaving great emptiness in the land. Though a tenth will remain in the land, it will be burned again, like the terebinth or the oak that leaves a stump when felled. The holy seed is the stump. <clears throat> so what is going on here in Isaiah's call? For one, what's beautiful is the beginning of his story. Isaiah is in the temple. Again, if he's having a vision or if this is physically happening, scholars are not entirely sure, but they know that it's something that actually happened. Isaiah looks into the temple of God and what he sees is the throne of God, the ultimate throne of God. Okay, So the throne that we see in Revelation is the same throne that he's looking at. God is seated. Do we, does he describe God though? No. If you'll notice, he doesn't describe his face, his eyes, or, or, or the way his appearance, even his, his upper body. No, nothing. It seems that God is so big <clears throat> that it is one of his tassels from his robe. If you don't know what a tassel is, it's basically the fringe of a coat. The tassels of one of his, uh, uh, from his coat is filling the entirety of the temple. By the way, this temple is huge. So you're already getting the sense of like the, the fullness of God and the place begins to fill with smoke. What is happening? And what does he hear? He hears from God talking to him, right? So Isaiah starts to have this moment as he looks up in above the throne itself. He starts to see these creatures that are flying around. They're called seraphim. Now seraphim are different from cherubim. And, and again, I will make this clear over and over again for those of you to know. Angels do not have wings. So the fact that these are described as a different type of angelic being that has wings, that means that they are a very specific group. When angels show up in our realm, they don't have wings. They look like human beings, okay? And angels are not depicted with wings in heaven either. And, and it's, a, it's a whole long story, but let's, for the sake of clarity, okay? So here are the seraphim. Seraphim are different from cherubim. The cherubim are the ones that were originally on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember that? If you've ever watched Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Lost Ark, there are these angels that have wings that are kind of pointed towards each other, right? And in between their wings is the throne of God. Here, Isaiah sees the throne of God above. So this, he's not looking at, you know, necessarily the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. He's rather looking at the holiest of holy spots within the temple. He sees God seated. He can't fully see God's face. But he knows that above the throne, there's these angelic beings that are called seraphim. These seraphim have six wings. With two of them, they fly. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, they cover their faces. Why? Why this whole covering thing? Is it that they're ashamed? No. <clears throat> These angels are showing that there is a respect of level of the reverence of God. They're the ones flying around and they're declaring to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies or the, the, the Lord of all the earth. The whole earth is filled with his glory. As they're declaring this, this is their worship. Their job is to fly around the throne room and to encourage one another and to worship God. That Literally, this is their one job. They cover their faces because they're like, God is so holy, so holy, holy. By the way, the word holy is such a complicated word. Because it doesn't mean that God is morally right. We normally think of holy and we think of morality. Morality isn't a part of it. It's rather <clears throat> distinctiveness, if you will. <clears throat> God is declared holy, holy, holy. If we can translate that into the English, it would be better translated, he is separate, separate, separate. 
Meaning God is not in all. If we had a spectrum and humanity was on, this, on some sort of part of the spectrum, God is not on that spectrum at all. He has his own category. That's why they're calling to one another saying God is different, separate, completely not like any of us. He has his own category. He is his own. And as his own, he declares that he is holy. He is other. So these angels are calling to one another. In the midst of this moment, this is where Isaiah finally gets the kicker. He realizes, I shouldn't be here. And it's the holiness of God, the glory, the doxa of God, that is so imminent, it's just so intense that he can't handle it. And what does, immediately when we experience the holiness of God, the presence of God, what's the first thing that we feel as human beings? I am ruined. I am unholy. I am unclean. I am sinful. I am broken. Like it just, that's the, the nature of a human soul. So what does Isaiah do? He begins to declare the truth. Woe is me. I am ruined, meaning I'm going to die. Like I cannot be in the presence of God and live. True. <clears throat> Are there exceptions? Of course. Immediately as he starts to say this, he realizes not only am I a sinful person. Wait a second. I come from sinful people. Because if you remember, what is Israel doing? <clears throat> Israel is ruining their lives by being political, by being powerful, by, by using all, you know, and, and they're disobeying God and they're worshiping other gods and it's getting corrupt from the top leadership into the priesthood down to the people. Everyone is now corrupted because of the lack of leadership, right? So Isaiah goes, I can't, I can't. I'm unholy. They're unholy. Like we're not unholy, unclean rather. We're all unclean. We're all sinful. Here's something that oftentimes when we read the story, we read past it. Look very closely at what's happening. As Isaiah begins to declare these truths, and they are truth, by the way, and they are to a certain level an act of repentance. The angel, the seraphim, flies over to him and he has a burning coal. This is where scholars are confused. Where did the burning coal come from? Did he go outside of the temple to go get it? That's where the altar is. But here's the kicker. Isaiah has not sacrificed any animal in the situation. Are you telling me that he had an encounter with God where he did not first sacrifice to God? Yes. So where are these coals from? Other scholars believe they may have been from the altar of incense, which is inside the Holy of Holies. But that would be weird for him to grab that and bring it over and then touch Isaiah's lips. So the question is, Where's the coal from? Wherever the coal is from, it's something supernatural. The angel grabs it with tongs because it's blazing hot, and then he touches Isaiah's lips. But what's funny is Isaiah's lips don't burn. So again, where does the coal come from? As he touches Isaiah's lips, he then tells Isaiah that this physical action that doesn't actually do anything is a representative of a reality that just took place. AKA, this has now touched your lips. So your sin is atoned for and your guilt has now been removed. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Pastor Johnny, are you trying to tell me that Isaiah didn't sacrifice an animal? He didn't go through the proper process of having this encounter with God, meaning the cleansing and, and the altar and the sacrifice and the, yeah. So are you telling me that all of this, God giving him the coal, touching his lips, and declaring him clean and holy, and forgiving him for his sins, even though no animal was sacrificed? That sounds like an act of grace. Ha! Yes! Yes! God literally has done everything necessary for Isaiah to have a conversation with him. Well, isn't this story full of grace? And when Isaiah has this moment where he realizes God has provided everything necessary for him to have a relationship with God in that moment, God then looks around at one of his seraphim or all the seraphim and goes, Hey, guys, well, who shall we send and who will go on our behalf? Hmm, wonder. And where's little Isaiah? Right down there at the bottom. Me, send me, which is the appropriate response when freedom is finally found within a soul. 
And then there's the bad news. What I love is Isaiah jumps into this, both legs into his pants, like, let's go, right? He's just going. By the way, God never told them where he was sending him and for what. That, by the way, is often how the human soul responds. We're so excited that God has invited us into his story that we forget that we forgot to ask, what part in the story do I play? Well, that's the sad part <clears throat> and good part. God tells Isaiah, you are going to go to these people that are stubborn, and I want to let you know that the message you are about to give them on my behalf is going to make them not listen to you. Mm. Does that make you uncomfortable? Church, does it make you uncomfortable that God could potentially tell you, I am going to tell you things, but you aren't going to listen? God, are you preventing me from listening? Well, yes. If we're going to let the Bible speak for itself, and if we're going to go along with the entire Bible and let the theology that we form be formed by the entire Bible, does God make a heart stubborn? Yes. But not in the sense that you're thinking. You're thinking that God is almost purposefully causing someone to act against God. Well, that wouldn't make any sense because God loves every single soul that he's created. Rather, when a soul chooses to misbehave, when a soul chooses to pick sin over God, when it chooses to do its own thing, then what God does is he backs off. When God backs off, then the sensitivity to God is no longer there. What's the worst thing that God could do to a human soul, according to scripture? Leave them alone. It's not a matter of praying for your enemies. God, destroy them, take them out, and all that stuff. Wow, the worst thing you could pray for an enemy is God, leave them alone. And God leaves alone when that person has made the decision, I don't want anything to do with you. And he goes, well, okay. I am honoring your wishes. Which means that even though I'm going to tell you to repent, you're not going to repent because I'm not close to you. And you're not sensitive to me. Your choice. So he tells Isaiah, you're going to go and you're going to tell them and they're not going to listen to you. And as a result, they are going to be taken over by another nation. In fact, now we jump into the politics of it. What was going on with Isaiah? Isaiah says, in the year that King Isaiah died. You guys remember that part? King Isaiah was a phenomenal king. But his kids, especially one called Ahaz, was terrible. And they started to lead people the wrong direction. Isaiah was warning Ahaz. Here's what Ahaz did. Ahaz had an issue. Ahaz was kind of not being friendly with the other Israelite kingdom. Remember, there's Israel and then there's Judah. And as a result of this conflict, then Israel felt, you know what? We're going to do ourselves a favor. We're going to go over and we're going to Ahaz. And we'll put in his place someone who will cooperate with us. See the politics? As a result, Ahaz, who has Assyria kind of lurking in the darkness, right? Assyria is trying to fight them, but Assyria is not really that strong yet. Eventually, Assyria is going to come over and take Israel captive into exile. But they're not strong enough yet. So Israel then ends up defeating right Assyria for a moment. But then Ahaz has the audacity to go over to the Assyrians and go, Hey, I just want to, one, show you guys... We have a lot of treasure here. Yes, we do. We have a lot of silver, gold, jewels. Oh, you name it. We got it. From whose treasury? From God's treasury. That's not yours to show. Ahaz starts to butter them up and go, listen, I know we defeated you guys and there might be some tension, but I I, I was wondering if you guys could, you know, like um, pledge your allegiance to me. Why does Ahaz want this? Because he knows that he's about to have friendly fire where the other side of Israel and Judah are going to end up attacking him, try to kill him to replace him with a king that's a little bit more cooperative so that they can fight off the Assyrians. Instead, he goes, I'm going to make Assyria my friend and I'm going to protect my back. And either way, they're weak. Isaiah warns Ahaz and goes, listen, why did you just show them all the things that we have here? Why did you show them stuff from the temple and from the treasury? That is inappropriate and that is wrong. Secondly, you are not depending on God to defend you. You're depending on Assyria? Good luck with that. Because the fact of the matter is, as history goes on, Assyria would stab Ahaz in the back. Ta-da! When we go into chapter 7, Isaiah has been told, you're going to talk to people, they're going to be stubborn. <gasps> but I skipped something. At the end of the chapter, chapter 6, God does this weird thing. He says, listen, Isaiah, they're not going to hear you. They're not going to listen to you. 
Except. How many of you guys like that word? Except. Except for there's going to be a tenth, 10% 10 of people that are going to listen and they are going to repent. That's what we call a remnant. By the way, there's always been a remnant. In the process of leaving a remnant, he finally tells him. Also, there's going to be a stump, like a tree that's been cut down and burned. The holy seed. The holy seed? What holy seed? There will be a remnant of Israel. You see, there's a story that's going on in the background. The story is this. From the beginning of time, God created humanity, but humanity chose to take stuff into their own hands, which gave birth to sin. As a result, all the universe as we know it, including us as human beings, have been broken. But God has already placed into the story a redemptive plan. Ahaz, being a part of that redemptive plan, has ruined the redemptive plan because eventually Assyria is going to come over and take them, which potentially means, Israel, you're done. And the plan is no longer. I want you to read chapter 7. <clears throat> More specifically, I want you to read chapter 7, verse 10. As Isaiah is talking to Israel and to Ahaz and going, hey, listen, guys, you're gonna get you're gonna get destroyed by Assyria. And just just watch, they're gonna come over. He says this. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Isaiah is extending grace to Ahaz, going, go ahead, ask God something. God will respond to you. It doesn't matter how deep it is. It doesn't matter how profound you're asking. Just ask it. And you know what Ahaz has the audacity to say? But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. You think that sounds like humility. It's not. What Ahaz is saying is, uh, yeah, no, thank you. Why? Because I don't care. I don't care what God has to say. I'm taking matters into my hands. Thanks. I've got it from here. I don't need your revelations. I'm, I'm fine. Isaiah said, this is his response to Ahaz's no thank you. Listen, house of David. It is not enough for you to try the patience of men. Will you also try the patience of God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you your people and your father's household such a time as has never been since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will break, he will, sorry, he will bring the king of Assyria. Why would randomly Isaiah go, you don't want a sign? Okay, well, you're going to get one anyway. And it's almost as if we are given a glimpse into something greater than ourselves. Isaiah has this profound prophetic moment. He goes, listen, from the line of David, even though Ahaz is ruining everything, potentially the entire plan, God is still faithful. God is still faithful. Can I just, whatever you're doing, stop. Listen to my words carefully. God is still faithful. And so he tells everyone listening, you will see a virgin or a young lady who will have a son, and she will call him Emmanuel. Who is this Emmanuel? We're not given the details. All we're told is that he will choose good, and he will reject what is evil, and he will do that from his infancy. He will be a greater king. Ahaz will come to an end. Do you guys remember when I was talking to you about Waldo and how exciting it was when you were staring at that page for eternity and then you found Waldo? And what was he doing? Walking as if he was just walking on to the next scene? And every page you would see Waldo and the next page you would see Waldo and the next page you would see Waldo. 
something that God has revealed to me as, as we've been studying the book of Genesis, Jeremiah, we've studied Daniel, we've studied Revelation, we've studied, um, um, the other one escapes me, but we've, we've, we've looked at these books and now the picture is starting to, it's almost like the puzzle pieces are finally fitting where they're supposed to be. And it's this picture of, you will see from Genesis all the way to this point in Isaiah that God says, I will hold my side of the covenant as long as you hold yours. And humanity time and time again messes it up. Humanity has drama. Humanity has politics. It has people's agendas, people's brokenness, people... It's almost like looking at a crowded page that has way too much going on. You don't know where to rest your eyes. You're just constantly seeing these different events. And then you find from Genesis till here and even beyond. Actually, since we just finished Revelation. From Genesis to Revelation. You see God carrying his promises and his covenant with his people through every scene. Regardless of how bad humanity and how crowded and how messed up and how how messy they have made the situation, you see God still expanding and giving and 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 blessing with grace upon grace upon grace, and still holding on to the promise. I promise that I will fix you. I promise that I will be your God. I promise that I will dwell with humanity again. I promise that I will extract Satan and his kingdom and sin and death, and I will bring heaven and earth together again. I promise that I will be with you. I promise that I will guide you and I will be your God. Every page that you turn, and here we are in the midst of Isaiah and the politics and the dirtiness and the and, 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 and the ruining of the plan, and Israel's about to be taken into exile, and chances are we'll never see them again. And God says, there will still be a king from the line of David. He will still be the Messiah. I am not finished yet. Day one of Advent is hope. You see, with God, there is always hope. When God isn't involved, then hope is lost. So I want to, as I close this, to ask you, do you realize how much hope God has given you? I dare you to look back at your life and find Waldo find Waldo? I dare you to look back at your life and see the moments when you've had the worst chaos and you see your God still holding up his side of the promise. It might be in the crowd. It might be in the chaos. It might be in all the distractions. But you will see God standing there waving at you going, I'm still holding on to the promises I've given you. I am still redeeming you. I am still forgiving you. I am still with you. I am still cooperating even in with your brokenness and how you've ruined things. My plan has not been ruined. And my love for you has not changed. There is still hope. Let that hope burn like a fire and consume every part of your soul. Grace and peace be with you. This is the way. This Advent's going to be awesome. Have a great Sunday.